feet. When you touch me, work that body. Hard times, give your body up. Is it all over my face? Hot shot. Just a model. Do it to the music. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Don't make me wait. I love Let's Go Dancing. Let's go dancing. Let's go have some fun. We come alive after our nine to five. You know, that told the whole story. I know this this is all very, very much like it was the last time I was here, which was like 20 more years ago. <laughs> I was born in Everett, Massachusetts, which is about eight miles north of Boston. Uh, my folks lived in Revere, Massachusetts. I was the only child. I never thought the music business as being a future. I loved music uh, from the time I was 13 years old. I used to go into Boston, you know, by myself and sit through three movies in order to see four stage shows of the live bands that used to come to the RKO Theater. I mean, Ray Anthony and Tommy Dorsey and Jimmy Dorsey and Glenn Miller. So from that time and when I used to go on dates and go to the Totem Pole Ballroom and they had the same live bands, live music always, you know, just made my hair stand up on my arms. I realized I was gay from probably when I was six years old. Uh, I realized something was, you know, a little different. I had a couple of buddies that we used to fool around. They've married grandchildren now. But I kind of, you know, uh, kept the tradition going. <laughs> In my generation, kids came out later, and the reason is because it was frightening. I mean, you didn't talk about it. I thought I was the only one. I wondered and worried how my life was gonna be. And I remember going into Boston and picking up, for some reason, sailors. Had the first encounter been something that would have frightened me, it probably would have ended, you know, my even thinking that way. But one led to another and so forth and so on. And when nature calls, you act on it, you know. <laughs> the thing is, I was out there, you know, as a kid, and everything had to be kept inside. And I feel, you know, looking back, that it took a lot of guts and, and you know, like, uh, I think I did all right for myself as far as, you know, as a life and not going, you know, like crazy because growing up gay at that time was really a bitch. 1950, 51 to 56, I was at Northeastern University. I joined a fraternity and uh, was very popular in the fraternity. I was corresponding secretary in less than a year. I was the uh, vice president and in charge of pledges. So I went through the motions, graduated with a BA degree, which qualified me for like nothing. And right after I got out of college, I got drafted. When I got back to the States, my whole life changed to a trick I met in the park. It was someone that I met in the public gardens and you know, it was a sexual encounter. And every once in a while I would ring his bell, you know, it was a door trick or whatever. And one Sunday morning I rang his bell and he was entertaining some friends from New York. They were having a brunch. He invited me in and I met someone there that we kind of hit it off. He was secretary to the president of ABC Paramount Records. And then one day he called me and said, hey, you know, like there's an opening here at ABC. Would you be interested? The job was $65 a week, but getting away and getting on my own, you know, was like freedom. So I took the job and I rented a room in Queens in uh, Roosevelt Avenue. And that's how I got out of Boston and got into the music business. When they decided to put on field reps, they asked me if I'd like one of those jobs. Cleveland was my home base. And I had Indiana, Upper State New York, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, and Michigan. And at that time, if you had a record on the radio at WHK in Cleveland, you knew that you could spread it around the country. That was a place to break records. I got a car, and I remember when I first went to pick up my car, the license plate number said QJ uh, 835, 435. 
And I went, oh my God, they're going to know a queer Jew. <laughs> Other field reps would always call this, you know, these outlying places and say, hey, do you need any records? But for me, I went and visited them. I set up window displays for them. I did things that you know other guys didn't do, and they appreciated it. After about a year, I got a phone call from ABC in New York again and said, hey, Mel, would you like to come back to New York? And I decided to go back. I got an apartment on East 83rd, a fifth floor walk up, and took over production, which I didn't know anything about. You know, like putting the singles together, uh, the you know the copy, get all the albums, and it, it was quite a, you know a job. And then beside ABC Paramount, they had Impulse Records. Then they took over Command Records, and then Ray Charles came on the scene. ABC recorded Ray Charles for the first time. Modern sounds in country and western music. It was very innovative because it was the first time that they used strings with country and western. It was a million-selling album. I worked on production of Ray's label, Tangerine, as well. It was a July 4th weekend, and it had been raining on Friday night, and, like, the sandpiper closed, and, you know, everyone went home. And I got to the back to the house, and I, I, you know, I think I just feel like taking a walk. It stopped raining, so I took a walk and I went down near the co-ops down there, and I was just standing. And this guy walked by, and stopped and started talking, and, you know, like it was dark. It, it, I could see he was attractive, but, I, you know, couldn't see him too closely. And we, you know, I said, where are you staying? And he said, I came out here with a friend and we had a fight and he asked me to leave. And so like, I realized he was walking around, he had no place to stay. My first thing was, you know, like, I can't let this ni nice Jewish kid go home by himself. So I said, if you don't mind, you could come back and stay at the house that I'm staying at, you can sleep on the couch. So he came back and naturally he didn't sleep on the couch and that was the night that I met Michael Brody. He was a 19-year-old messenger on Wall Street. I found out back then, I mean, he had the most beautiful smile, the most incredible teeth and eyes. I, he was a sweet kid. But he also, <laughs> he knew what he was doing. And one time I asked him years later, you know, how come you went with me? And, and he, because he, there was this guy, John Rodriguez, this kid who's a very handsome Cuban, and he said, one, one star in a family is enough, <laughs> which is pretty hot, hot shit stuff for a 19-year-old messenger. One night, just the two of us in the office at the garage, I said, Michael, don't you ever remember the good times we had together? He said, of course I do, Mel. My life began when I met you. I don't think anyone could ask for a, a more beautiful, you know, um, declaration on that. I mean, it, to me, that meant everything. The 60s was a time of, uh, of revolution. I mean, it, it was a time of cultural revolution. Women were finally demanding their rights and their equalities. The pill had been invented, so women had a level of sexual freedom. Blacks wanted their rights. The war in Vietnam was a very wrong-minded war. And gay people were participating in all of those movements. I think at a certain point, uh, we start to say, well, what about us? Of course, we know the Stonewall was instrumental in the Stonewall riots, which changed the law in New York, the, the cabaret law, to say that two men could dance together. I mean, before that, it was illegal for two people of the same sex to get on a dance floor together. So the Stonewall riots basically changed that law. It changed everything. As it was happening, you could feel it. You could feel the world change. Those of us who had been raised on freedom theories of Abby Hoffman and hippies and the anti-war demonstrations and the liberal free love movement of the 60s, I was imbued with that as a teenager. Well, when I got to be 21 years old, 
and an adult, we all began to live those ideas of free love and liberation and if it feels good, do it, and as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else, it's okay. That's how the whole club industry flourished. I mean, many, many different um, aspects came together to make the whole scene happen. It was like, I didn't realize how huge the gay population was because it was so underground. And then once it came out in the open, it really flourished and all the main clubs that uh, I was influenced by and I felt influenced the things we do today uh, were totally dominated by the gay culture. I used to go to the Firehouse, which was a gay community center at the time, and Barry Lederer was the DJ there and I was friendly with him. We knew one another from Fire Island. I would play Black Skin Blue Eyed Boys. I would play Harlem by Bill Withers. It was the gallery, uh, Nicky Ciano, who was a 17-year-old kid that started his own club. I had a girlfriend at the time, was talking to her about it. We went, we priced things, put together a budget, and just per chance, we went to my brother, who was 10 years older than us, and said, look, we want to do this. And per chance, he had just settled uh, an insurance case and had $10,000 and decided to invest it in this club that we proposed to him. And boom, there was the gallery. Then there was the sanctuary, which was a converted church. I just remember seeing people high as kites in nothing but little, the, the smaller shorts than Daisy Duke ever w thought about wearing. I mean, and on shoes that looked like they were this high and dancing like crazy fools. But then, you know, I was introduced to The Loft. The Loft is probably the most influential club. I mean, it, it influenced, you know, the gallery, it influenced the Paradise Garage. A good friend of mine named David Rodriguez, who used to work at Downstairs Records, it was a record shop on 42nd Street in the subway. And um, he's the one who introduced me to The Loft. <laughs> And I guess it changed my life, actually. We like to believe that Soho was such a liberal and hip area. David had a black and gay and Hispanic club. So because David had a club like that, they had to have a lawyer who worked the door because that community that was that hip artist community was always trying to close the loft down. In the early days of disco, disco and R&B were, were somewhat interchangeable. A good up-tempo R&B record was often a disco record. I was a big James Brown fan. Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. I'll Always Love My Mama, to me, is a black opera. And then Love is the Message became like an anthem. I wish I can rewind the whole tape and take you back at that time when we were recording that. Gamble's mom is a Jehovah Witness. So he brought in these um, Watchtower magazines. And the mother used to preach to him like, love is the message. You gotta love your neighbor, love this and love. So anyway, he, he come up with the idea, love is the message, let's write a song around that. And we did, we wrote a groove. And we put it together with Norman Harris, God bless his soul and Ronnie Baker, uh, Earl, you know, Larry Washington, a conga player. And we put that thing together as a rhythm set. Lenny Pakul on organ, my cell phone vibes, and we come up with MFSB, mother, father, sister, brother. You know, I tried to emphasize over and over that the music of the 70s, especially the early, uh, mid-70s, was nothing called disco, what people think of as a disco record. It was danceable R&B. I mean, the Blue Magic and the Spinners, and Isaac Hayes, Diana Ross, the Gamble and Huff Motown. No one could call that disco music. It was danceable R&B. All that music was the music that we danced to. First time I met Mel was, I believe, 1971. I was working in the warehouse for Scepter Records, and Mel was uh, in charge of production for all of Scepter Records. 
Florence Greenberg, the woman that owned the company, created songs like Soldier Boy and, you know, the Shirelles, Dion Warwick and B.J. Thomas and the disco thing. She may have thought it was just a, you know, a flash in the pan. There was always something very interesting about him. He would always, um, he'd ask a question, challenge the way things were done. And he had a sense of what was going on in the club scene. Scepter had the independence, a song called Leaving Me, and it was a big R&B record. But they, on the B side of the record was a song called I Love You, Yes I Do. After Leaving Me had its run and you know sold a lot of records, suddenly there was a resurgence of sales on the record. And no one at the company knew why. But because I was going to the clubs, I realized and was able to tell them that the DJs in the clubs were playing I Love You, Yes I Do. The DJs I believe that influenced me the most um, would be David Mancuso, Nicky Ciano, Michael Capello, Richie Kazar, Larry Patterson. The person you have to give one of the most credit to is Francis Grasso. Uh, T. Scott, Dave Rodriguez, Walter Gibbons. It was myself and Bobby DJ who were the first people to play Love's Theme at the island. Bobby played it at the Cherry Grove. I played it at a gigantic party on the beach. No one had ever heard the record. The moment it came on, it's like... People there were transformed into another world. It was amazing. No one had ever heard anything like it. Well, Love's Theme was a key song because it was the first time, I think, that the record companies turned around and said, whoa, these DJs have influence. Historically, radio ruled the roots. If you weren't on radio, your record was dead. We immediately started playing Love's Theme, and Love's Theme started to climb the charts without any radio play. And now they found a, 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 an outlet where they could promote their records without radio. It was the first time in history. So it became monumental. One night this guy, Jerry Rosenbaum, took Michael and myself to the loft and we were just standing on the stairs and, you know, like uh, we were going to the different, you know, clubs. And um, I remember just saying, wouldn't it be great to have a place like this where black, white, straight and gay can come together? And that was, you know, maybe a year before we start going, you know, separate ways. And Michael, you know, like, um, took some money out of our joint bank account and, you know, went in with these two other guys and opened up Reed Street. When he found Larry, he called me one day and said, Mel, I found the guy that's going to make it happen for me. And those were the exact words. And he was talking about Larry. I met Larry at Reed Street. I think Michael Brody, yeah, Michael Brody did Reed Street. And that club was so hot. When I real... When I, when I first saw Larry, and Larry, he didn't mix like everybody else. Everybody else was kind of mixing it up. He was just boom, boom. He was just slap, slap. He would just hit you over the head with the mix. Just his selection. I realized at that point, I said, this guy's a genius. All the DJs had were 45 records, 45 RPM. And you know, like they wanted to be able to have something else to create. Just about that time, there was a record that Scepter got called We're on the Right Track by Ultra High Frequency. But it was only one song. So it was sitting there and we couldn't do anything with it. I remember standing in the hallway and I said, Sam, why don't we put the instrumental mix on the B side? And he said, oh no, Mel, people think they were cheating them. And I said, Sam, that's what they want. Finally, after much talking, I convinced them and we put the instrumental mix on the B side and that became standard in the industry. That year we won the Billboard Trendsetter Award for being the first company to put an instrumental mix on the B-side. I would go to Mel's office in the early days to pick up the Shirelles, to pick up Dionne Warwick, because that's what I was playing. But when disco started to become a prominent force and I was playing at the island, I would start going to pick up 
the records I really wanted, like the records that um, Mel was working on with Tom Moulton, like Patty Joe, Ain't No Love Lost, um, Make Me Believe in You, Ultra High Frequency, We're on the Right Track, and of course, BT Express. This guy came up to the office one day wanting to, you know, get records. His name was Tom Moulton. He was the one that came up with the suggestion that uh, Scepter put out the first 12-inch DJ record on the 12-inch. At the same time, I didn't know that he, he worked at Salso and got Salso to put out the first commercial 12-inch. It was a Friday and he wanted an acetate to play and Jose ran out of the 10-inch acetate so he had a 12-inch and, you know, like he said, oh, well, you know, it could spread the grooves and it'll make it hotter. And so that's how the 12 inch came about. And I was smart enough to listen to him and put the first DJ record from Scepter and it was called Bobby Moore, Call Me Your Anything Man. He put out a record that had one song on it and I remember thinking, this is not gonna work. Why would anyone buy a record the size of an album with only one song on it? Creatively, you had more room to do longer versions, have long intros, have long breakdowns, have long endings. It was more about longer songs. Uh, I think 12 inches allowed for that, longer and louder. And it made a tremendous, tremendous impact on the disco industry. It was the excitement of having an extended mix that thrilled the dance floor and brought it to great heights. And remember, we were all on drugs. And, but even if you weren't on drugs, um, you still could enjoy the record. And Mel was a leader, he was, he was the first, absolutely the first. Seventy-six, Scepter went out of business. Everyone went to different places. You know, the disco thing was getting popular. So Ed Cushions at that time said to me, hey, why don't we start our own company? Ed Cushions was the sales guy at Scepter. I said, you know, I don't know anything about starting a company. So he said to me, look, you want to take time off? Let's start the label. You can go and do whatever you want. I'll take care of things. Ed was the business guy and Mel was the creative guy. So Ed cut the deals for the price of the records. Ed collected the billing. You know, Mel really, I think, went and found the talent. I don't know if you'd want to call Mel the wild one and Ed the tame one, but Ed was the down-to-earth guy and uh, Mel was the guy who dealt with Larry LeVan and all of the club craziness and all of that. We got a, a small room, a one room downstairs in the same building on the sixth floor where Opal Studio was, and we started West End Records. Ed Cushions used to go to the West End of the Bahamas, and he pulled out something in his pocket that said West End, and so we decided to call it West End Records, where the sun sets and the stars rise. I think my very first West End record was, I think it was just a model. That was a big street classic for b-boys. Sesamato was the Italian name for how funny can sex be. It had a nice slow groove and it was so smooth. We got a phone call from Ed Auslander who was the president of E.B. Marks Music. He said, we understand that you're the disco mavens, as he called it, and he said they had a song and could we make it into a disco record? So I called in uh, DJ Jimmy Stewart, and while we were in the studio, Jimmy said, Mel, I have this extra piece of tape. Do you mind if I reverse it for sound effects? Two years later, I remember Grandmaster Flash telling me that when Sesamato came out, he said that was the very first record that the rappers uptown used the bits and pieces of it to do their rapping. The part where he reversed the tape was his first sound of scratching. So sound effect turned into really what became a phenomenon years later uh, as scratching. That was actually one of the first records that I tried to sample because the, the drum loop was so hard. I think I, I did a demo with Coogee Rap and Polo on the Sesamato beat. Hip hop has a lot to thank records like Sesamato because when it came to the break, that's where it stopped because that was a cue for the MC to come in and do its thing. We were on the cutting edge without realizing it. We got a tape in from a guy in Paris called Pierre Jobert, and it was an artist that he called Michel. So I turned it over to 
Tom Moulton, and he took it to Philadelphia and put together the first West End album. Can You Feel It to me, that was a hot song. It was a great dance record and uh, it had a great groove to it. You know, it reminded me of MFSB, it reminded me of uh, Baker Harrison Young. It had the spirit of, of that Philly sound, for sure. Mel was at West End, but I didn't know he was at West End. I knew this other promoter, and I went up there to see the promoter, and I was like, oh, hi, Mel. They were talking about the future and what we're going to have and how great West End's going to be, and soon there's going to be a club that is going to have really great DJ, and it's going to play just, you know, all the music like that's special. I remember going to the garage, not realizing the connection, but then soon finding out that Mel was involved with that, and that Larry was the DJ he was talking about. I had heard about it at Reed Street, that they were opening this new place, and that they had these construction parties. It was one room, and there was like a, on this side over here, there was like a, just a bar. It looked like a bar, just a, like a coat check. And that's where Larry was set up. I remember just walking in that it was just this intense party. He's playing like Galaxy by War. And I'm just up looking at the crowd going, wow, the energy in here is unbelievable. It's like you're playing for a room full of DJs because they all love music so much. It closed down and then it opened the big room. And then that small room became the crystal room. And then it expanded again to a theater room. And then the roof opened up. Let's see if I can remember. I was trying to remember when you walked across the room and then there was this person standing in this little booth. And you were always nervous that you wouldn't get in if you didn't if you didn't know somebody was a member you couldn't get in. And, and if you could get past him then you would go up the ramp and as soon as you go up the ramp it was like heaven. It was an amazing experience because you could hear the thumping of the music. And you would get like butterflies in your stomach when you're walking into that into that space and it was more than the lights and the sound it was it was magic and you can't really pinpoint exactly why something is magic why a painting is great why a certain book is genius it was more like a social club more like a church more like a uh, um, family when i first started going there i didn't know anybody i was a complete i waited outside and cried they let me in. I had a friend that took me the first time, but when he stopped going, I was hooked and they wouldn't let me in without him. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm staying. I'm not leaving until you let me in. And they find that was Michael Brody, and he was finally nice to me one day and let me in. Michael wanted money for the garage. I loaned him money. I said, I'll just support you and become a financial backer. But I didn't want to go in with him, which was, you know, not too smart. One of my second 12 inches I ever bought in my life when I started buying records was Karen Young Hot Shot. Oh yeah, yeah, that was hot. It had that beat that just got your blood going. That was big, gay record for me. <laughs> With that one song, she became an international star. Who knows how many Karen Young Hot Shot they sold. They could have sold millions. Karen Young was licensed internationally, probably in every country in the world. And in the heyday of disco, I mean, uh, like I said, you, you don't know. So that could have been their biggest record, Karen Young's Hot Shot. It was, it was an unbelievable song. Well, the first time I heard Hot Shot was at the Paradise Garage. And Larry played that song about five or six times. That was a track not only being in the garage, but every single club that you went to. It has a charm to it, and, uh, and a magic to it, and it is a great record. Any other label would have probably said, well, maybe we like that, but go to a proper studio and, studio and fix it up and make it sound professional, but they didn't. You know, it became a huge, huge hit. I just remember she could sing the hell out of that song at the drop of a hat in any condition. I didn't even know this girl was white. I mean, it surprised a lot of people when she performed. You saw this teased Farrah Fawcett hairdo, and she was, had bad sight, so she'd walk very carefully, looking at the ground. I remember when I helped her on stage when she was performing, she took off her glasses, she couldn't see the steps. I'd go, one more step, one more step. She was very nice. But, uh, and then she opened her mouth and pow! Ah!
first song that I loved on West End, that I didn't even know it was on West End, was Work That Body. You can help but move when you heard that song. When I think of that song, I, I think about the Paradise Garage, I think about Larry LeVan and hearing that record there because he played that record like no, no one else did. My first production was Work That Body. Just that, that bass line. That whole bass thing, it just, it was, it was original, but it all came from being in the garage. Because if you didn't have a hard bass, you just, you know, no one felt it. And then the syncopation of the melody with that bass line. Got me jumping, got me jumping. I don't know, it's kind of unusual too, like sort of like the chord progression of the way it, the way it moves. Um, the, mo the movement in that song is a little bit different, and I like that. After we finished Work That Body, I mean immediately, I took it to Larry. Larry put it on, and he was Kenny, I love this record. I wanted to go to South Soul or Prelude because, you know, West End, you know, who are they? They had Karen Young, yeah, that was it, you know, as far as I was concerned. I said, Larry, I want to take the record over here, and, you know, I want to take, he says, look, Kenny, we're taking the record to West End. We did this other track called When You Touch Me. The first time I heard when you touched me at the um, at the garage, I, I I almost had a heart attack. What stays in your box? Well, that's that's definitely one. Of them. It was rough and funky, but it was really the highest energy. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That had a lot of energy to it. That was a hot record. The crowd went nuts, and we played it from the beginning, from the slow part. Kenny made you groove, you know, very sensual. I did. Kenny's genius. And then when he broke into, when they broke into the um, kick and the fucking place just exploded. The people went wild over it. I mean, really, they loved that record. When You Touch Me is one of the ultimate high powered works all the time records as far as I'm concerned. That is my favorite record on, um, on, on West End. You know, I play it all the time. People probably sick of me playing it. But. <laughs> you can ask my colleagues, do I not play When You Touch Me all the time? Everywhere I go, you know, still there. It's like, why are you playing this record? Well, hey, you'll catch it. You gotta, you'll catch it sooner or later. <laughs> that bass line, can't fuck with it. It's like, that's a bad tune. She hit some notes in that too. It's just like, <laughs> and I can't do it. But she, you had like something like that where it'd be a moment where it would all crystallize. I mean, you know, another Larry LeVan mix, that record really, uh, to this day competes with a lot of the music that's out now. Larry LeVan was the epitome of a powerful DJ. Personally, I don't believe I would have been here if it wasn't for icons like such as Larry LeVan. You know, because he managed to do in a period of 10 years what many people strive to accomplish in their lifetime, you know what I mean? And then there was the garage. The Paradise Garage was unique, very unique, because I could attribute sales directly to the Paradise Garage. Final Mania and the Garage were sort of like one entity. We supplied the music for Larry. He came in, he shopped there. It was a big scene. People gathered around to see him in person. He was just a, a vision in the DJ booth for most people. And this was a chance for people to like see him in the flesh. If I knew that something was gonna go on at the garage, I would call Vinyl Mania and say, look, you gotta buy this record because, you know, Larry's gonna play this record or it's gonna happen. Sure enough, he opens up the store Sunday morning. And they run into Vinyl Mania and go, I just heard the song at the garage. Yes, I have it. It's the one club that was like that. There was no other club like that. Think of it as a, as a business. I mean, come on. 10 years of, you know, 3,000 people buying your product, testing your test products and the success of it, with each one becoming an album or a big artist or whatever, a lot of it, it's like big bands, just like whatever, before my time. It's like Motown. Of course, not the same amount of zeros, but the same influence, as far as I'm concerned. The label 
had done well, and my partner said, we're either going to pay the money for taxes because we made so much money, let's have a distributor meeting in San Francisco, invite all our distributors for a weekend. And so we did. It cost us like $75,000. But when we came back from that convention, the shit hit the fan. I mean, like, business got really bad, and some of the product that we had wasn't up to par. We put out this album, Colleen Heather, Till this day, I don't know why we did it. The old classic Malaguena, nothing much happened. The Tana Gartner album didn't do much. And then Arthur Baker came in with his first production called Kind of Life, Kind of Love. Kind of love. See, now that might be my favorite. Kind of Life was a classy record. It was all about the North End of Boston. A lot of people came down from Boston. I mean, Arthur Baker, Joey Carvello, Dana Giacovitis. There was a whole scene of people up in Boston that played these New York records. Everybody knows Arthur Baker's story. In the 80s, he went on to become the first superstar remix. You know, sometimes a song, you could hear the first note, and you go, hmm, and it just grabbed you right away. Kind of like grabbed me right away. You know, it worked with everybody. It worked with the Latinos, African Americans, like everybody liked that too. You gotta give it up to Mel for choosing a record like that. It was kind of an embarrassing moment, Disco Sucks. That was a blip on the radar screen, but I think it certainly is still cited as a point when the corner was turned. And I think it was racial and I think it was homophobic. Disco was everything at that time, and one way of them trying to get their frustrations out was doing that whole little bullshit thing in Comiskey Park. Disco, in the commercialized sense, was like, you know, baby face, like a, like a disco beat to it, or like some stupid song like that. So you got Disco Ethel Merman, Disco Classical, you got uh, Disco Duck, you know. It's a perfect target, and as this industry is growing, it's really selling a lot, you're starting to see on these artists on the cover, Rolling Stone, the straight white rock and rollers, really had a problem. Record company executives are notorious for being able, you could say boo, at the right time and scare the hell out of them, especially if they're on a coke jag, like a lot of them were. I mean, so I think they probably just got scared. Thought, oh, hey, this is 15,000 people in the stadium burning disco records, maybe we better change something. So what do they do? They didn't change the music. They just changed the name of it. They changed it from disco to dance. The underground dance music stayed the same. The only thing that was happening, you know, for a couple of friends uh, early on, Nick Rock, Rick Relikoff, uh, amongst, you know, a uh, few uh, were starting to, you know, wind up in the hospital. We had no idea what the reason was. Uh, it, it was frightening to you know to everyone because you know we didn't know what was going on and we didn't know for quite a, a long time is it all over my face all over my face is one of the most genius records that was hot it's all over my face what is it <laughs> i mean that's one of those timeless Timeless record. Loose joints, man. All over your face. You know, that was a call and response song in Chicago. You know, it, is it all over my face? They take the music out and everybody say, hell yeah, I'm in love dancing. Is it all over my face? Hell yeah, I'm in love dancing. That was a um, Steve DeQuisto thing. Steve DeQuisto. He was a, a real character because, you know, like, he was very talented, but he, people, he frightened people. Steve DeQuisto uh, at that time was a DJ at The Loft. It wasn't Steve that was the talent. Arthur Russell was the talent. Arthur played the cello, he played keyboards, he played the drum. I mean, Arthur played every instrument there was. Arthur was friends with Allen Ginsberg and Richard Hell and, and, and Arthur Russell would go to the mud club, would go to the punk clubs, and he would go to the discos. He would work with John Cage, you know, he was totally in the punk world, but he could make a disco record. I said, we're gonna go in the studio and, you know, we'll, we'll listen to what Arthur's trying to do and we'll create 
a, a groove. And uh, that's, that's pretty much what we did. Steve DeCristo chased me down Broadway from 54th Street to about 46th Street. He kept saying, I want to change the name of the group to uh, Loose Joints, Loose Joints. By the time I got to 46th Street, I said, hell, you know, like at that time, people were, you know, standing on the street corner selling loose joints. And I thought, shit, well, they'll be doing promotion for us. So I, I you know, said, okay. To this day, I play, is it all over my face and when you touch me, a lot. I think I play, is it all over my face every other time I play. We put the record out with, you know, uh, the male vocal and nothing was happening. So Larry went in the studio and at that time we were, you know, like really broke. That record was being mixed by Larry, and Larry was doing it on studio time that he didn't have, and the people came in and found out that he was there, and they kicked him out, and he had done this raw mix, which is what came out. And I'm always happy about that because he may have gone longer, he may have changed things, but he found that girl's vocal and put it on, and I was at the garage on a Saturday night when Frankie Crocker from WBLS was there, he played it, and Monday was on BLS. It became an underground local hit, you know, New York. It's become bigger today than it ever was before. Heartbeat. Oh, God. Heartbeat, I love that record. That's one of those songs that changed a lot. Heartbeat changed everything. That one record brought it back. I'm not really a fan of that record. Sorry, I'm honest. The actual heartbeat, like to me, was just like, you know, wow, that is the coolest record ever. It's really not a disco record. It's really a funk soul record. This bass line came to my head, mm -hmm. and I started dancing. This is no joke. I started dancing, I mean, as if I was in the garage or somewhere. I got up the next day, and I'm walking down the street, and I'm like giving this boom, 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 boom. And that bass line comes back. Because usually, you know, as a great, sometimes once it's gone, you blew it. You, you, you should have recorded it or something. So I'm walking down the street, and I don't realize I'm dancing. I'm in the fish market, and this old white lady is going like this. And I'm looking at her. I'm like, what's wrong with her? Why is she going like that? And I didn't realize that I was still dancing. I'm still, I'm actually in there dancing to this music in my head. I know people must have thought I was insane. The variation of the record was great because it went from the beginning of the heartbeat to a full-fledged song, chorus change, and back down to the heartbeat. Hey, a, a perfect song. I didn't take that record to West End, all right? I went to Atlantic, Epic, I went to Prelude. Let's put it this way, everybody shot it down. So, where else could I go? <laughs> Both Kenny Nix and I have said many times, if it wasn't for Larry LeVan, Heartbeat never would have happened. Larry puts this record on, and entirely every single person in the room left the room. Everybody shot it down. Kenny is too slow, it's too this, it's too this, it's too... Everybody hated it. It was in the middle of the disco era. No one wanted to hear nothing under 120, 130 BPMs. Only one that was doing that really was Larry. He was the only one that had the boss to let you be in a party and take it here and, you know, and give you any emotion instead of taking up and banging you over the head all night. The crowd had such respect for him that they, oh, they got it. And, and once they got it, the rest is history. One of the songs that came out on West End that I was very proud of because the producer was this young black kid that he dissected the lyrics for me. It was Larry Joseph and he said, let's go dancing, let's go have some fun. We come alive after our nine to five. 
exactly, you know, that told the whole story. Let's Go Dancing was done by Spark. Let's Go Dancing, what a song. It just captures the spirit of being in New York at that time and working hard all week. Just ain't no good. Do something else if we only could. You know, that's why we had to go out. Let's go dancing, let's go have some. It just was perfectly written. I remember when Larry put this record on, people were just like, if they were drinking something, they would finish it, drop it, that's my record, run to the dance floor, and just boogie. These were people that really knew how to put together a record for a club atmosphere. I mean, it, it was like it was like kind of like a new thing. That's probably the, the, the most well-written record that I felt on the label, even today. Back in the very early days of AIDS, Mel was selling raffle tickets to fight the gay cancer. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, there's a disease, and it hadn't been named yet, and apparently it was affecting some of the gay population in New York, and there was no awareness of it. The first person ever to make me aware of it was Mel. I started getting these calls. People, you know, were aware that I, I was writing for the gay press, and so I'd get, you know, gay people would call me from time to time with tidbits of information. And there were some calls, uh, uh, I think it was one or two different people, um, saying that there were some gay men in intensive care units in the city and that they had some mysterious disease and they didn't know what it was and it was very serious and they didn't think it was a single epidemic because it didn't really fit. There was different people from different backgrounds with different kinds of problems. Some of them had uh, pneumocystis pneumonia. I guess a couple of them had the Kaposi sarcoma and they, they didn't, it didn't yet fit together clearly as, as an epidemic. This is the information we got that went into this very first article. Uh, which the, the New York native, their heading was disease rumors largely unfounded. There was, you know, understandably a real degree of panic in the community. I mean, people saw that New York Times article by Lawrence Altman that came some weeks later. You know, they didn't know what it was. We didn't know what it was. First it was one, two, and then it was, you know, a half a dozen, and then it, would, it reached the point that there were like 40 people in the, in the hospitals. And that's why, you know, I said that gay people should be thanked for letting the world know that there was a, a crisis, because if it left it up to the damn government, it would have taken them, God knows, another decade to find out. It felt like people were still trying to figure out what was going on in 81. And within that year when people started to die, that there was this rude and painful awakening that, oh my God, you know, this is, there's something really happening here. I remember that first Times article about, you know, Fire Island and gay men were having this disease, but didn't know anyone until David Rodriguez got sick very early on in like 81 or 82. Um, and uh, it brought it home for me, you know, I saw it right there. I saw David, David who was this zoftic kind of guy, all of a sudden get very thin. He, he had um, cryptosporidiosis, which is a, a parasite that you just can't get rid of and diarrhea all the time. and. It was just sad, it was really, and then it got devastating. I mean, people can't imagine, like half the people that you know are gone in a few years. I mean, they can't fathom that really, but that's what it was like. The whole AIDS epidemic changed everything. It still changes everything. AIDS forced people who didn't ever want to even think about homosexuality to confront it.
There were political organizations and, and cliques and things already in place, but that's not where the action was unfolding in terms of, of response, this earliest response to AIDS. It started to unfold in Fire Island. And this is where the world of Mel and Paul Popham and these people come in. Larry reprinted my articles and took them out to Fire Island and started passing them out. He was very, very concerned and very angry and wanted us to be a lot more organized and a lot more serious about what was going on. And, and of course, he was right. Paul Popham was this handsome uh, former Green Beret who was just absolutely worshipped by throngs of gay men. So, as with many grassroots organizations, these folks came together in someone's living room and began this process of trying to figure out how to respond to this crisis. In fairly short order, six of us finally came together and became in Larry's living room again and became the co-founders of this organization that we decided to call Gay Men's Health Crisis. So they, they formed GMHC and, and they didn't have any place to, to start it and Mel gave them 22nd Street basically. It was a single room occupancy building, somewhat run down. It was still kind of a shell and I think the upstairs was, you know, still completely unrenovated. But he had empty rooms and so all those empty rooms he let GMHC use. So that's how this became our first home. Why did you feel compelled to let them have space? <sighs> it was a family, was, you know, these were friends. Uh, you know, like I had the space and I suggested wanting to take over the building for a couple of years, and um, they didn't do it, but uh, they were there until 1984. The Peach Boys. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a great record, yes, Peach Boys, yeah. That was the sound of the garage, no, no question about it. We were doing a dance called the Smurf, <laughs> and like we would listen to like Pac Jam, you know, like the Johnson Crew, and then like Peach Boys came, and it was Don't Make Me Wait. Like you could go to a party and hear it played like ten times, and you never get sick of it. You just wanted to do the Smurf and listen to the Peach Boys. <laughs> Well, Don't Make Me Wait is the epitome of what was happening on West End. Remember the Larry Mel connection. Now all of a sudden, Larry was making the record. You know, I got Larry to do this first mix ever. It was for Sesame Street called C is for Cookie. And you listen to it today and it still stands up. You know, so when Larry said he wanted to do a record, it would have been foolish for me to, you know, try to, uh, you know, stop him. That record was so different. I mean, there was nothing that sounded like the Peach Boys. Nothing at all. I mean, those hand claps on Don't Make Me Wait, it was just like a real innovative thing. He, he got an idea and he, and he went with it. He was, you know, he was a genius. And you know, Bernard Fowler's vocal on there is, you know, something special. Acapella that was used on top of everything. I mean, it's just the default of underground music. You know, you just can't get away from Don't Make Me Wait. When Larry said to me, Mel, I want to do acapella for Don't Make Me Wait, I said, acapella with disco, Larry? And he said, yeah. And two minutes later, I said, okay, because, you know, I wasn't going to, you know, doubt his talent. The acapella and and Don't Make Me Wait has become legendary. I mean, it's been used over and over. Because Larry was so meticulous and the way he worked, which was slowly, we were waiting forever for that record to come. People were dying for that record to come out. Mel says go in the studio, take all the time you need. 
You don't say that to someone like Larry. That's like letting a, a five-year-old loose in a candy store saying, eat all the candy you want. Yeah, 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 yeah. Larry had been playing that record and it was embraced immediately. And, and by the time that record came out, it was an anthem. The Peach Boys and Loose Joints are two examples of what I call modern West End. Early West End was the uh, female vocalist doing the typical club tune. These were different records. I liked them very much. Do it to the music. I remember roller skating to that record back in the days. I bought that record. I bought it maybe two or three times. That was one of the songs that gave me chills. It gives me chills when I hear that song. Raw Silk Do It to the Music is like an obvious thing. It's just, just a chugging, really infectious kind of like group. And um, vocals were amazing. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> yes, I love that. Get moving, get grooving, come on everybody. With feeling, yeah. That song had a large part of my first disco slash clubbing, nightclub experiences actually. Mel managed to sail from the 70s into the 80s and keep the label consistent, putting out good quality records, even when the music became a little more electronic and disco was no longer the, the hot thing. He came out with records such as Do It To The Music, Rossil. To me, that record alone is, is a pure definition of class, you know what I mean? It was very electronic, but it sounded so polished. And then um, it was just sexy. That was just a sexy song. There was a time when Profile and West End were three doors from each other or two doors from each other, the same floor of the same office building. Probably some producers would get to us first, and then if we didn't like a record, go down the hall to West End. And I think Do It To The Music was a record like that, where I didn't hear what Mel heard in that record when it was brought to me in its original form. But Mel was right. Once they fixed that record and, and, and did a new mix to it, it was a really, really good record. DLS, Frankie Crocker, had a top five show. This record was on number one for five weeks. It was huge, huge. I mean, every person that came in the store bought one. Just picture owning a store, and every single person that comes in selects this one item. Guaranteed. Do it, do it, do it. <laughs> These two guys brought in a record to me that sat on my desk for weeks and weeks and weeks. There was something about it that I really liked and I wanted to do something with it. Finally did, and it was a song called Ride on the Rhythm. So you come along and ride on the rhythm, ride on the rhythm. Ride on the rhythm, great. I think about Frankie Crocker playing it on WBLS. Frankie Crocker put that song in my living room, okay? I love that sound so much because it was like club music, dance music, it was R&B, it was radio music, it was everything. Again, just like, you know, people feeling good in that disco, you know, lyrics kind of like, oh, come alive, come and ride on the rhythm. It's just like, and you do see people come alive when they go to a club. In those days, there was no such thing as a tempo thing, you know what I mean? It didn't have to be a fast 125 record. It could have been this 108 BPM record, but it was funky and it sounded great and people were dancing to it. Everybody used to come to this spot, Little Spot in Queens, and Ride the rhythm. Everybody, what you thought? What am I doing? And, and it was hot because it was instrumental one side. I could tell you, it was instrumental one side and the vocal on the other side. Nice mixes. Always came across the speakers right. Big request. Till to this day, that's that's a hot joint right there. Do you remember when I said she's got the papers and I've got the man? The record that was brought into us. I heard it about four times before I, I really understood what it was saying. And it was Butching that brought us this record. Barbara Mason, who was well known for a record she did, you know, when she was 16 years old, called Yes, I'm Ready. Butch produced a record called Another Man. Another man is beating my time. Another man is beating my time. Caught up in a little, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Now that, let me tell you, that record, I, I didn't even understand that record at first. I love that record. That was one of the funniest records. By the time I realized what she was saying in that song, I said, wow. That was a gay record. Hello, gay. Like, and they're playing it on the radio. 
I love that record. I, it was one of those records that for me just was like, wow, thought provoking. Such a cleverly written freaking record. Like, what, who would even, like, you really have to be in another place to write a song so clever that it could be relevant still today. A girl saying to a girl, another man is beating my time, another man is loving mine, is saying, hey, my, my husband or my man is having an affair with a man. And it happens every day. Everybody doesn't say it, but it's not like people aren't aware of it, you know, so I didn't understand the controversy. You know, it was just something different for the listener that they weren't used to hearing in the song. You know, we put it out and it became a quite a sizable hit. But there were things in the song that kind of made me, as a gay person, think, you know, I'm a little embarrassed because she said there must have been a defect, a defect when he was, you know, born, something like that. Little things that, you know, like I know it was tongue in cheek and all that, but it really bothered me. And a long time later, I got him to do a remix and take out some of the things, you know, that I thought were offensive. There was a certain kind of a way that he talked to me. His voice went up. You know, at first he was talking like, yeah, baby, yeah. And then he went, and, I don't, and, and it kept going up and down. And then there must have been, I figure, a defect of um, not when he was created, but somewhere along the line, something went wrong. Christmas of 83, I went to Lenox Hill Hospital because one of my dearest, dearest friends, Ray Ford, had just come down with toxic plasmosis. Ray passed away on like January 2nd. Well, that morning we went to a funeral. This guy, Herb Marshall, passed away, went to that funeral, came back, and I got a call from Dick Fisher to tell me that Ray got out of the hospital and he tried to commit suicide because he didn't want any, to be beholding to anyone. I mean, you know, like, it was every day there was someone dying. Every day. And Ray, I, I mean, like, I mean, you know, we, he was like my therapist. I mean, we would talk hours at a time, you know, and, you know. Mal was so, you know, distracted basically by the, the AIDS crisis. And it was the kind of thing that like West End just couldn't, couldn't get his attention as much. This was, and he, I think he, he just he said, okay, just take it. And he gave him the stock, I think, just go with it. You know, do whatever you have to do. I stepped away from West End at the end of 1984. My partner at the time kept telling me every day I walked in the office, we're going bankrupt, we're going bankrupt. And it was frustrating. And I was more and more involved with the stress of losing friends and doing drugs, you know, to, to forget about a lot of things. And I finally just said, hey, Here's my stock. Do whatever you want with it. We are 1985. Actor Rock Hudson announces he has AIDS, putting the epidemic on the front pages of newspapers and magazines around the country. The infection has surfaced now on continents around the planet. 20,470 cases of AIDS have been reported in the U.S. 8,161 are dead. It didn't, it didn't compute. You just didn't know what was happening. I mean, you knew what it was and you knew what was going on, but it was like, this can't really be happening. You always thought it was going to end the next day. And then when we found out about Michael, that was pretty much when it really hit home. It was like, this can't be. It was like the, the final blow for Mel, you know, after losing so many friends and having so many friends get sick to have Michael be sick. I had been after Michael for a while. I said, Michael, I'd, I'd like to see your apartment, the place that he bought on Canal Street. So we sat down and I was facing him like I was just a few inches away from him. He opened up a bottle of wine and we were talking. And I just looked at it and I said, Michael, what's that on your chin? And he looked at me and he didn't have to say anything. He just looked at me like, Mel, you know, 
what do you think it is? And, uh, and he said, I brought it on myself or something. Once Michael started to decline, I mean, the staff sort of heard the rumors, but we never knew until Michael told us about several months before the club actually closed uh, that he was ill and the club was not going to reopen anymore. He wanted everyone to have enough time to look for another job. Michael was very proud of the Paradise Garage and what it meant to the membership what it stood for in the industry. The club was very well respected. I believe that Michael couldn't do it anymore if it was, he was dying and you know, the garage era was gonna die with him. God, the closing of the garage was, it was devastating. It was just absolutely devastating. And it felt very, um, you know, discombobulating and gray and you know, it's like being underwater and, and at night where it was just like oh, where do you go and it was very tragic for Larry for the garage to have been closed I know that I left after a weekend I don't know what time it was but I know when Larry played weekend I just said you know what it's not gonna get oh this is hard I can't even like talk about it, but when he played um, Weekend, that was real, you know, that was it for me. It was December 28th, and I remember, you know, like I did it when my mother passed away. Um, you know, I went to the club, I went to Baseline, and that's the one time, that was when I really didn't know who Junior was, but I happened to mention to him that Michael passed away, and he, I never forgot it, he lit candles and, they had a, like a little, you know, a, a moment of silence for him. I ran off to St. Thomas, because that's some place where Michael and I spent time, and I just stayed at this, hotel up in the hill, and I could cry without anyone watching me, and, and that was that, what I did. My name is Mel Sharon, Bill Cushion's my partner at West End Records. I had told Ed that I wanted to, I thought it was time that the recording industry as a whole got together, they've done Band-Aid, Farm-Aid, all kinds of AIDS, it's time we did Aid for AIDS. I wanted to do something for Michael because the garage has done so much for the record industry. That's when I started 24 Hours for Life. 24 Hours for Life was, you know, Mel's great idea. Choose one day out of the year in which everybody would do something, you know, for AIDS. We believe we can raise in one 24-hour period, one day worldwide. One hundred million dollars, and that's our goal. The design people had gotten it together, Broadway was getting it together, but there really hadn't been a you know, music industry organization, you know, stepping up to the play for, to fight against AIDS. We have a music convention, and music people uh, should be involved. And as you can see, the seats are empty, because a lot of people don't give a damn. And it's time that everyone gave a damn. AIDS is not a gay disease. And it's time that everyone found out and knew it. I guess the greatest legacy of 24 Hours for Life is that, you know, it was the fiscal sponsor for LifeBeat. LifeBeat is the music industry fights AIDS. It's a charity that was founded by Bob Caviano and Daniel Glass. And it has evolved over 14 years into an HIV AIDS prevention charity for young people. And Mel was very crucial in helping this organization get off the ground by providing financial backing. Uh, prior to LifeBeat uh, receiving its official status as a nonprofit organization. So he's a very integral part of the birth of this organization. He remains on the board today as passionate as always on this issue. The music continued on, but it didn't have the place for the artists to perform and it didn't have the following in numbers that the garage had. None of the other clubs in New York City 
would become committed to that sound. Ed was here a long time and kept West End alive right out of this location. Remember, they, they had closed their doors and one partner had walked away from it. The other partner was working out of here. Larry went through some really bad periods where he was doing a lot of drugs and didn't care anymore. He was living on 23rd Street at the time and I was living not too far from him and I'd run into him on the street a lot. He would come around Sound Factory and he would come in DJ booth and he would tell me, well, you shouldn't work the crossover this way, you should do this and that and the other thing. I said, Larry, this is my thing now. And it got to a point where I wouldn't, they'd tell me he, Larry was at the front door. I said, don't let him up to the booth, please. One time after Sound Factory, we walked the whole way from Sound Factory to my house, and me and Larry just talked and talked and talked. And I've, I've said this before, that I felt that that's the day he passed, passed the torch to me. I really understood him that day because he had said a lot to me and how he started and, and his family, and it was hard for him to, to trust people and why people were around him and why the necess necessary to take the drugs because to dilute himself from not finding really true love and all, all this kind of stuff in his town. That was a monumental day for me, being able to have that like eight hour walk with him. Hi everyone, it's so nice to see some of these people I haven't seen in a long time. Uh, I was wondering if Joey could come and move these speakers just a little more, Joey. It's not sounding exactly right. I, got, I just got a call and they said Larry died and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. And uh, it was the saddest day of my life. Uh, when I used to hang out in the booth next to him, standing there watching whatever he played, he used to turn to me and say, you see that little group down there? Watch what happens when I play this record. <laughs> he knew. He had names for all of you. There was the Sentimentally It's You group. There was the We Got the Funk group. All of you. And when you were down there dancing and you felt like he was playing that record for you, he was playing it for you. I'm gonna miss the shit out of him. I love him. Come on. It's great to see that he made something of himself. And I will never forget that David Mancuso and Nicky Ciano gave me my education. T. Scott gave me my break, but Larry Levan gave me my career. I'll never forget you, Larry. You made the music that made me dance. I know that you're getting Garage 2 ready for us. Please save a place on the dance floor for me. What I remember most was at the end of the ceremony, after everybody had their words to say and their little stories of memories of him, um, Francois played Oops. It was one night late I met him I think it was on either on 9th Avenue or 10th Avenue and there he was, Trump, you know, Mel walking down the street, and of course we start talking. And then I said to him, I said, Mel, what are you, you know, I don't understand what you did. I mean, you had a fight with Ed, and you just walked away from your company. I said, you're crazy. I said, here's what's important. You own 50% of a record company. You got all the masters in your house. He's licensing the records and making income. It's a great label, and I, and I I just remember him going on like, you know, I'm fighting with that, and I said, fuck that, everybody fights. He kept saying, you're a fool, and I realized that Ed would not stay in the business if he wasn't making a living, but I just couldn't bring myself to suing him. So I called him to my apartment, 
And I said, you know, I want my stock back. And he said to me, your history. And that's those three words, you are history. You know, like, that's what I said, fuck you, son of a bitch. And I started, you know, the lawsuit. And it was just at that time when he tried to almost pass off heartbeat for 3500 My attorneys stopped it, and we were able to put off the negotiation until after Here Come the Hot Stepper came out and the record became number one in the world. By that time, we were in the driver's seat, and that's when I had the wherewithal to buy him out. When I first started working with Mel, uh, the only thing that was out was the Tana Gardner record, and uh, so what I was doing was trying to get the office together and then looking into getting the classics reissued. I think Mel's ambitions now are keep the legacy of the label moving forward and keep the label alive, which means keeping the classics out and available and also keeping the same sort of musical aesthetic going with the new releases, which, you know, for Mel has always been R&B-based dance music. Mel has touched so many people in dance music. You want to call it disco, you want to call it danceable r and I don't care what you want to call it. Somewhere along the line, they probably had to go past Mel's house. Mel is the person who always had a love of music and a love of people and a sense of an obligation within himself to kind of uplift people. And the medium which he chose to do that was always music. Thanks again for this wonderful honor, which I dedicate to two people, Michael Brody and Larry Levan. He really conquered with West End Records the music scene in general. I think he did a lot for us. Uh, he's probably done the most for us than anybody else has ever done. You know, if we had like the four heads on the Mount Rushmore or something, and dance music, he'd have a head. <laughs> I think it's uh, being at the forefront of a great label. Hot Shot was weird sounding. Heartbeat was very weird sounding. Is It All Over My Face by Loose Joints. Very weird sounding records. Nobody would sign these records, except for one guy. We're never gonna ever be able to eclipse or even get near Mel and his instincts for music. It's just incredible. To be the man who was responsible for the first instrumental version of a record being on the B side, to be the man who was instrumental in making the Paradise Garage happen, and instrumental in Larry LeVan's career. I mean, these are monumental things in the dance music industry. If it wasn't for him and the, and the group of the garage, I wouldn't be sitting here right now talking about this. And I think that that's what his, his thing is. He was, he was a pioneer in developing this thing that started that I wish that we, someone somehow could get back to. It'll be music, I believe, and all the things that he's done in the fight against HIV and AIDS. HIV and AIDS really had a tremendous impact on the club scene. We, we lost a lot of very talented DJs, producers, artists, writers. But Mel was one of the first to do something about it. Not just talk the talk, he walked the walk. You know, I think he's gonna be remembered for, you know, having been an important part in the fight to end a horrible epidemic. Mel Sharon's legacy is a man who can live life, enjoy it, be compassionate and, and sharing with his community, and discover and nurture talent, and be part of a golden age of music in America. And the time that he has been here and been effective on culture, he's made an impact. Mel has figured out that you get more back by sharing. Save a place on the dance floor for me